and we're going to hear from Jen Brace. She is the chief futurist at Ford. If she's there, she is over there. Come on, come on up, Jen. So welcome, Jen. And she's really going to share. Well, let's first. Yes, everyone. And we're going to. We'll sit over here. You don't have to stand by okay. me here. You can go into the one closest. Smooth transition here, okay. <laughs> um, and yeah, we're gonna really break this down in terms of what everyone is trying to figure out how to be with consumers, how do we need to adapt, and Jen, you're gonna answer all of those questions for us right <laughs> That's now. Right. All the answers yes. right here. But, but actually, I do think you have such a cool title, you know, I, so it's, I think, you I know, just, you know, that futurist and, what is that, and why, especially today, is that so important? Um, well, you're right. It is. I do like to tell people that I have the coolest title at the company, so um, you are spot on there. Um, but really, what I think about, so I, I run a team, uh, we call ourselves Trends and Futuring, so we spend a lot of time paying attention to what we see happening in the world. And we are purposely looking outside of automotive. We, try, we use an outside-in perspective, and what we look at tends to be um, the steep categories. Uh, so that stands for social, technological, economic, environmental, and political. You will notice I did not mention automotive. That is by design. Now, because we like to start at this very high level, I like to call it the 10,000 foot view, and then work our way into what does that mean if we're seeing these shifts in consumer sentiment on a social level, on a political level, um, how does that come back and change the environment that we are operating within? And how might it change the way that we need to develop our products, our services, and, and the ways that we are connecting with our consumers? So it's really trying to understand where are people at? How is the environment around us changing as a business so that we can be better prepared for the future? Well, okay, so the trends report. And I just realized I didn't grab the clicker. So <laughs> no one noticed this, but I will get up and grab it since. Divert your eyes. I don't normally control clickers. All right, because this is where we get to see some fun slides. So, but with the report, obviously mm -hmm. this is something where you're really talking about consumers taking the lead, yep. wanting control. Talk about that and let's, oh, we do have the first slide up. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that in terms of how it's not only impacting the auto industry, yeah. but also just for your, you know, itself. Uh, absolutely, so um, this is our 12th year doing the survey and, and looking to understand what we see happening around the world. And this year, we, um, we called it Charting My Path. Uh, and this is what we're seeing is a reaction from consumers of years of feeling like things are outside of their control, of, of feeling like the world around them is changing very quickly. And what they're doing is they are looking inward and looking to control the things that they have in their life to give them a better sense of stability. So we see 77% of people saying that prioritizing themselves gives them this sense of stability in a world that feels out of their control or somewhat chaotic. In prior years, we've talked a lot about people feeling the sense of overwhelm based on the changes that they see happening around themselves. And, and it's almost, we think of it as almost like this low-grade fever of stress, anxiety, overwhelm that is happening outside of uh, their kind of purview of control. And so what people are doing is they're, they're looking to prioritize themselves or they're asking themselves the questions, you know, how can I, how can I feel like I've got better control? How can I prioritize myself? They're, they're changing some of the, the traditional milestones that we might look at in terms of what success means and what, is it, what does success look like to individuals. Um, so we're seeing shifts happening and, and frankly, like that's, that's exactly why we do the survey, to try to understand where are people at, what is consumer sentiment at, so that we are having a better understanding of where our customers are coming from, how they are reacting to the world around them, and then how our products can help fit into, um, into their lives as those, those shifts or those changes in expectations are happening. Well, and talk specifically, Ford, in terms mm -hmm. of what you are trying to do. You said people are feeling stressed. Yeah. So how are you <laughs> handling that, aside from maybe sending them to a shrink? You know, like, I <laughs> right. mean, what are you doing to really Which, help alleviate you that? You know, we have had a, a connection with the Calm app with our Lincoln products in the past. So not exactly a shrink, but not too far off. Um, but the, the, some of the things that we're trying to do is looking for these ways, recognizing that people need these breaks. Um, sometimes on my team we call them joy snacks. People need a little joy snack in their, in their day, a little break from the chaos. Um, and our Lincoln products in particular become this, this sanctuary. It's not just Lincoln, we can certainly look at um, our other vehicles like 
in the in the survey we talk about people prioritizing being outdoors more and that giving them that sense of reconnection uh, both to themselves to the people around them uh, I know we just saw a great clip of a Bronco kind of driving off in the sand so we certainly have some products that can help people make those connections whether it be to nature whether it be a sanctuary in terms of Lincoln we just introduced scents in Lincoln where you're able to get uh, more sensory experience, um, quite literally sensory, and that they can put um, different fragrances into the cabin. So this idea of, of giving the people the, this opportunity to kind of step back, feel like they're giving themselves that time, giving themselves that, that opportunity to you know, take a breath, step away from what they, feels chaotic, the vehicle can be that sanctuary for them. Well, and you, we talk about also they consumers want to feel like they're in more control. Yes. And we cannot not talk about where consumers are kind of feeling they may be losing control a little bit with AI. <laughs> yes. And, I mean, obviously, AI, you need to embrace it. We need to embrace it. Consumers even, in some ways, are embracing it. But the positive, yes, I now don't have to do these mundane little things, yeah. and I can actually spend my time on what I really want to do. The negative, what's happening with AI, what, how are you using mm -hmm. my information? So let's first focus on the positive. I like to see, <laughs> I like to look at things. <laughs> yeah. Well, glass half full. Yeah. So how is Ford embracing AI, um, and how is it helping you? Yeah, so you're absolutely right in terms of where consumers are at. Um, we've got a, a chapter on the site that's called AI Wary, where people are, they're optimistic. They think it's going to be a major part of their life. They, they see some hope in it. But they're also admitting that they don't really understand how it works or they're, they're even afraid of it. So there's certainly some, some trepidation there. But thinking about the optimistic side, one of the things that we're seeing, people are saying that they're expecting to trust AI to help make some decisions for them moving forward, like planning vacations, small purchase items, even mental health, physical health assessments. Um, so we are seeing people expecting and leaning into AI uh, in new ways. When it comes to Ford, some of the ways that, that we've been using it, so I can say on my team, uh, we do a ton of reading. Not a surprise, right, if we're trying to pay attention to what's going on in the world. And, and when ChatGPT came out, of course, it kind of blew up <laughs> Everybody's, <laughs> everybody's news feed. And, um, and we started questioning, okay, like how can we use this? What can we do with it? And what I was really impressed with was internally at Ford, what they did is we, we now have a, a firewalled safe, like LLM, large language model, which is what ChatGPT is, that lets employees utilize it and put in information and, and ask it to whether, like often we will ask it to summarize an article and then decide if we wanna go through and read the whole thing or summarize a report. And um, what they've done internally is given us a tool that we can use so that we don't, don't have to be worried about um, you know, any company information being put into that tool and then, of course, getting out as a, as a training resource for the, the larger chat GPT that is used around the world. So, um, so Ford is approaching it that way. Another really great thing that we're doing internally is looking, um, is publishing these AI principle ethics for the, um, for our employee base as well. So as we are looking at ways that AI will work itself into our vehicles, our products, our services, that we have some guidelines on the right way to implement it. So really trying to be um, human-centered in the way that we are approaching those things, recognizing that um, consumers are looking for companies to be open and upfront and honest with them. They are trying to figure out, they're, we're trying to navigate AI and what it means in our lives, and so we're looking for trusted sources. And, um, and that's where I've been really, really proud of what I see happening at Ford and the way that we are approaching utilizing this new technology and recognizing the fact that consumers are wary about it and, and have questions on how to use it and what it might mean for them. So I, I think it's a really smart approach to the way that we do it, and I think it's something that companies are going to have to continue to kind of grapple with in terms of the way that we use it because consumers are... Um, you know, they recognize that they're not entirely sure of what may or may not be real. We're in an election year. I think that's gonna come up a lot yeah. um, in terms of how is it being used, where is it being used, can you believe what you read, what you see. Uh, those, I expect that those conversations will continue to grow uh, because the technology is just getting better. I'm not sure if you've played with any of the, the technologies that create, you know, it could take a video of you and create an AI version yes. of you and, and some of those are kind of scary good. <laughs> 
and, and not only that, I have to say, even if on the customer service, that yeah. is completely scary. And yes, especially with the elections coming up, this you know, there's a lot of things that can be done that way. Or even for a brand, there can be yeah. you can be misrepresented in certain ways. Sure. But when you're talking even on a consumer basis or a cu customer centric basis. I'm cursing out my computer half the time because it's like, oh, you want to just do a quick chat? It's never a quick chat. And then right. usually I'm just like, you're useless. I'm going, and then I pick up the phone. So like, how ah, are you yes. handling when technology that? Because, goes wrong. Yes, it can go, you, you want to take advantage of these things. Yeah. You want to be able to offer consumers this better experience, yeah. but it's not always, how do you sort of work with that because you know it's not going to be perfect at this point. It, right. It's so important to understand, again, where customers are at. What are they worried about? How are they feeling? How are they reacting to it? And and you're at a huge risk, right? If you put out a product that only frustrates your consumers and wants makes them basically want to step away. So it's, it's recognizing, it's approaching it in a smart way. It's, of course, um, we do a lot, a lot of testing and and experimentation and pilots and things like that when we are looking at new technologies. So those things can can help. Um, and then the other thing I think is just building that trust, being authentic and being um, trusted. And and if something doesn't work, okay, let's talk about it. Let's figure out how we make it better. And, and I feel like that tends to be one of the ways that we continue to build trust with consumers is number one, being upfront with the way that it's being used. And then number two, um, being kind of open to that conversation around how we continue to, to make it better. And you touched on it in terms of just even providing that data, which yeah. is a huge concern and a lot of the reason you, once it's, there's only so much you can ask. You have to sort of add that value proposition mm -hmm. for if you want to continue getting more information. How are right. you sort of maneuvering that? Yeah, so that is uh, certainly some principles that are used internally with the way that we are both gathering and then using consumers' information, customers' information is is checking in with them and letting them know how it's being used, asking them if they are aware of it, if they are okay with it. So those are um, those are principles that are utilized internally in terms of being as um, trustworthy with uh, customers' data as possible. So we talked a bit, I mentioned earlier that consumers want to feel more of a connection with the brand that they're yeah. doing business with. They, they have expectations, they want to align with your values. Um, how are you trying to sort of make that connection more so than just the usual, you know, standard kind of <laughs> campaigns or strategies? Yeah, so you're absolutely right. So um, customers do look to support brands that align with their values and that when they, when they get the opportunity to feel heard, to feel seen, it's going to improve the relationship. You know, um, last year in our survey, we asked consumers if you had $1,000 would you spend it on an experience or on a material item? And about seven in 10 said that they would choose an experience. So people really lean in into that kind of experiential side. Um, and I see that happening at the company in terms of how can we, how can we give people better experiences? So the, the off rodeo is one excellent one that we're doing with Bronco. We're seeing different driving events with Mustangs and other products as well. So giving people the opportunity to experience and, and see those products, creating those, um, those evangelists, if you will, because um, often just getting that ability to actually get behind the wheel, understand the product, it's huge also within the EV space where people are kind of afraid of what they don't know. And then once they get the opportunity to try it and drive it, um, their perspective changes very quickly. So offering those opportunities to customers is huge, and it's something that we've been spending a lot of time on. Well, when you have these kind of the Bronco, what is the... The, the Rocco Off-Rodeo. The Okay, is it... First of all, what is the Bronco off rodeo? But how do you you need to you don't want it to be one and done? Like how do you maintain that goodwill, that connection, and then keep it going? Yeah, so I mean, once we are connecting with our customers, it's looking for ways that we can continue to support them. When it comes to something like the the Bronco off rodeo, it's it's recognizing, you know, people want to utilize these vehicles, but they're not always comfortable or know how or what it can do. So it's giving people that confidence in like a safe space that they can learn a little bit more about what the product can do. Um, and often what we do too is when someone's bought a vehicle, we give them the opportunity to go and take some of these classes. So it becomes um, an opportunity to number one, see what your vehicle can do 
build that confidence so that you can go out and do it yourself. And then it becomes that touch point. It becomes another touch point with our customers, our opportunity to check in with them, see how they're doing, see what um, really what's resonating with them with their products and, and how we can continue to support them, uh, especially uh, the Bronco is such a great example because it is this very capable vehicle. Uh, but for uh, a lot of average uh, customers like myself, um, I haven't been nearly so brave as to do a lot of off-roading. Uh, we have a Bronco uh, in our household, but when I'm able to be with an expert or someone that can show me what it can do, that enables that you know that confidence so that maybe I'll take it out on the sand dunes and and uh, play with it a little bit more and and really put it through what it what it is capable of. Well, you talked about, you mentioned, as you were talking about experiences, with the Mustang. So first I have to say, yes. happy anniversary. Mustang That's turns right. 60, 60 in like two weeks. Looking so. great for 60. Yeah, I would say so. Um, and I'm curious if that's part of the shift. Because I know, mm -hmm. like, if you think of the Mustang, you think of it as more of, you know, that guy's car, you know, yeah. kind of a muscle car. Sure. And... But I know, understand that it's actually now being skewed a little bit more towards women. Is that part of that, those shifts that you were talking about yeah. in the dynamic within, within the household? Yeah, so that is one of the changing kind of milestones, shifts, expectations uh, in the, that, we, that we talk about in our survey. So we've got a part of the survey is Family 2.0. And we're talking about how we're seeing um, more people saying that marriage isn't necessary or that they, um, they want society to support non-traditional gender roles more often and having that be a more kind of normal thing, particularly with younger people. I feel like this, um, this vision of the, you know, the young guy's muscle car, um, Mustang is bucking that trend for sure. We are seeing uh, more and more women saying, no, that's a car for me. Um, we've got this great connection with Sydney Sweeney. There is, I don't know if you guys have gone out and seen it. If not, you need to go see um, the, the vehicle that she was part of helping to design. It is beautiful. Um, but we are certainly seeing kind of the power of women, the power of female buyers, and, and not wanting to be in that box um, in terms of saying, um, oh, that's a guy's car. No, no, no. The ladies are, are quick to say, not so fast. Um, we well, got it. <laughs> well, I think even just earlier with the Jetta, the people thought it was more for women, but no, it's men and women. Um, but when you, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think I heard that initially the Mustang was for women. Like when you first came out 60 years mm -hmm. ago, which kind of, I'm, I was surprised at that. Then somehow it crossed over to men and then now back, women. Is it about women trying to overtake that, what is maybe oh, this man car, or is it just that that's the kind of car they're looking Like, what are you sort of you know, saying that's all about? Yeah, I don't have an exact answer for how we're seeing that shift, other than to say that what we are seeing, if we look at what we see from a trend perspective, is we are seeing kind of a... Um, Gender roles, if you would, if you used to think of gender roles as being kind of on two bookends, we we find them both coming towards the middle of, of a spectrum now, where we're seeing um, things that would have traditionally been considered male. We see more females doing it. Things that have would have traditionally been considered female, we're seeing more males do it. So we're actually seeing a bit of a more like gender normalization of things. So I would attribute it to that. Um, certainly, women like uh, a beautiful, fast, fun car just as much as men do. Um, and I think it also ties to the fact that um, these cars are meant to be to be fun and to be this experience. I mean, you could even look beyond that and say, you know, we're seeing women wait longer before they're having children, they're focused more on their career, they're, they're having fewer kids, they're getting married later in life. Um, so having a little more time to play um, before they need to kind of, you know, get a more family-focused vehicle that fits the car seat in the back. Well, then, so how... For everyone, it's kind of you. You need to target your audience. You mm -hmm. you're looking like you don't want to alienate. You don't want to say, yeah. okay, we're going to target men for this, and it's actually women or yeah. vice versa. Yeah. You don't want to lose the male audience. So, in general, what is Ford doing to sort of see these shifts and respond to these shifts, but still make sense of it in terms of that you're not then losing. Yeah, it's all about balance. It's it's all about making sure that you're not going too far in one direction or the other, understanding who you're targeting with which messaging and, and where and how you're meeting your customers with where they're at. So it's I think it's it you know, we're less likely to be able to just do a, a single 
um, outreach and think that that's all we need and that it's only going to be to one group of people because it's understanding where each group is coming from, what's going to be important to them, how are we understanding those customers and how are we meeting their, their needs and, and, and speaking to those, right? Kind of trying to elevate the stories that are going to be most, um, most relevant to them and resonate with where they're at. With everything, uh, obviously the full report, uh, if people want to see it, I'm sure so yes, they can get uh, it online. Yes, please, uh, FordTrends.com. You can check it out. You can also look up um, reports from prior years if you're curious to see what we've talked about because the truth is a lot of a lot of these trends have been shifting and evolving and growing for many years. Um, and I, I, I'll just touch on one because AI, we talked about it a little bit earlier, one of the um, one of the things that I like to remind people is that it's really not new that we've been talking about it for a long time. Um, we actually asked, um, you know, how people felt about AI back in 2019 in our survey uh, and where we saw, you know, at that time we had about 50, or I'm sorry, 40% of people saying that they were afraid of it or didn't understand it. Now that number has jumped up to 51%. So we've seen a, an increase since 2019. Um, but I like to to point that out as a reminder that despite the fact that we seem to be talking about it a lot more now than we were in the past, it's not new. We've been talking about it for quite a while. No, I mean, we, and we at all of the summits, that still comes up. It's yeah. just AI is no, not new. It's just, it's becoming more the hot topic. Absolutely. And, which is why I think we're seeing more concerns because I think otherwise mm -hmm. maybe a lot of people weren't necessarily even thinking about it. So I right. think that's coming out. But I'm curious in terms of this, this particular report, what yeah. struck you the most? With what was the most valuable insight that you learned um, oh. with the report that ha is helping you maybe reach your audience? Ooh, the most valuable insight. Um, so we've got a, a section in there to bring it back um, a bit closer to to the industry. I would say um, called um, uh, that's about really EVs and, and customers choosing between EVs, and it's we were asking people. You know, are you are you changing your behaviors to to help fight climate change? And most people said, "Oh yeah, absolutely, I'm doing that." And then when we dig just a little bit deeper, when we say, "Okay, um, how many of you agree with the statement? I'm really only willing to change my behaviors if the change is uh, in, is, is not inconvenient to me. Basically, I'm only going to do it if it's really easy." And that's where we get over 60% of people agreeing with it. So this idea that it's really got to be easy for people to be willing to make a change. Um, and that, that's something that, that we talk about in terms of like, what does it mean for, for EVs? You know, what does it mean for an electric vehicle and, and how are people being um, open to that change or are they open to that change? Um, and, and the beauty is of course that we, we have a full lineup that gives people choice where they can you know, continue with a, a gas powered vehicle, they can get a hybrid or they can get an electric vehicle. So it's, it's not trying to box them in, but it is trying to understand where they're at. Um, we also asked people what was most um, concerning to them, and we definitely saw, you know, uh, charging infrastructure is one of the things that they're that they're looking to get um, that they want to see better. They also want to see people that they know own a ve own an electric vehicle, so they can hear from their trusted, like close peers. So I am, I thought both of those things were really interesting when we're thinking about, especially with respect to the charging infrastructure. Um, we had a big announcement this year in, in us enabling um, Tesla superchargers to be part of our network for um, for charging our electric vehicles, which is really increasing those places that people can find infrastructure. So I think there's going to be a lot of talk um, staying in that that space to help kind of get rid of the charging anxiety um, that some people are, are experiencing or that become some of the why buys around, uh, or why not buys around this transition to EVs. Well, and so, because obviously EVs are huge co conversation in this room especially, yeah. but when you know that that is a point that you need to deal with, mm -hmm. how do you go about that? Like, is this, again, you don't want to bombard, but at the same point, is it part of just the learning in terms of through the advertising, through the what you have on your site, and people can go for information? Like, how can you sort of alleviate those fears to then bring people more on board? I mean, I think it's it's going to be a combination of a lot of different approaches, right? So certainly we can talk about it, um, but but we also need to be showing up. We need people to understand. Well, how is it actually different than what you're doing today? Um, how nice is it to never have to go back to the gas station after <laughs> you've done that for years? Um, so it's, 
it's, I would say it's a multi-pronged approach, right? Making sure that people have a trusted source for information, which they could find, of course, at their dealer, at the at our websites, within our advertising and things like that. Um, but also recognizing, right, if people are more likely to trust their neighbor, their family member, you know, how can we make sure that we're supporting our owners with proper information and making sure that they're able to kind of become ambassadors for the brand? So there's an opportunity there. Um, and then on top of that, continuing to increase, like if we understand that consumers are worried about infrastructure, how do we keep telling the story of that getting better and, and not just telling the story, but making sure that it is getting better and alleviating some of those concerns? So it's, I would say there's not a single answer. There's a lot. There's a lot that has to go you gotta, into that, You got to right? teach them. Well, I have one more question for you, but then we're going to open it up to okay. all of you. So think of what you'd like to ask. Um, with the insights that you have now moving forward, what's, what are you most excited about to sort of dive into? Ooh, what am I most excited? Honestly, like the thing that, that I continue to find most interesting are some of the shifts that we're seeing with respect to uh, really mental health, personal health, well-being, and how people are approaching it and how it's kind of changing some of the decisions that they're making. Um, and then, of course, how can the vehicle start to play a role within that space as we see the focus and the interest in well-being and personal health continue um, to increase. So that's what I'm most excited about. There's a lots of other exciting things happening, but on a personal level, that's the one I like the best. And I... Yeah, I think there's a video oh, here with uh, the I Sydney Sweeney, yes. I never knew it was. Do I press green? <laughs> In my dreams, I can picture the perfect Mustang. And guess what? My dream car could be yours. But where to begin? After working on my vintage Mustang, I know that no detail is too small. Custom paint. A reimagined interior. Chrome. It needs chrome. A little personal touch. Perfect. This car is full of surprises. What will you find behind the wheel? Yeah, and we're giving one away, so, you know, enter we and enter go here? take a look at it upstairs. <laughs> if you haven't seen it, it is beautiful. Very nice. So, I, well, it's funny because I was thinking, like, it's kind of a boring slide that they sent. <laughs> <laughs> so now I understand why. Okay, so now we can open up. Anyone have any questions? I have a question. I, it's Tanya. Hi. Hey, I heard that Sydney is being considered as the next Bond girl. Could that mean we would see a... Mustang in a James Bond movie, perhaps? Oh, my futurist uh, crystal ball gives me no indication. <laughs> uh, I have no idea. But, but how cool would that, that be? So. That would be very cool. Does anybody have a question? Oh, here we go. No, he's waving. I'm sorry. Does anybody have a question for Jen? I mean, she's got a crystal ball. Ask her a question. You know, I actually wanted to do a follow-up from when you were saying, looking forward to what people... Have, how are you able to get the powers that be at Ford to wrap mm -hmm. themselves around this psychological kind of thinking. You know, I mean, yeah. it, it's usually bottom line. It, yeah, it, it is. And that is always a challenge when doing this type of work, right? So, um, and I recognize that if I, if I walk into a meeting and I'm talking too much about something that feels completely unrelated, I'm going to lose the audience. So what it what I'm often trying to do is say, hey, if we see this starting, you know, if we see mental health, taking precedence in terms of priorities. Um, then I start to walk it back in terms of how do we connect those dots back to why Ford needs to care. So being able to connect those dots back into how is it changing our consumer's perspective, how is it changing the marketplace, what might our competitors be doing. So it's always being able to make the, that connection back. Um, otherwise, yeah, it, they, they have no, no interest in hearing about it. Um, 
just interesting for the sake of interesting isn't going to take it far enough. So it's really always trying to look for what are the shifts that are happening that feel like they're disconnected from automotive, but that could come back and impact our business. And how do we how do we think through how that impact could could impact us? <laughs> how the impact could could hit us? Ultimately, it comes that back to the bottom line. <laughs> yes, it, exactly. Ultimately, it, and it needs to. Um, so yeah, it is making sure that we are considering these external factors. And the truth is, the the reason that we look at some of this stuff is because we expect most of the people at the company are not. We have a ton of experts at the company that know all kinds of things about what's happening within the automotive industry, um, and. They're experts at what they do, and I, I let them kind of own that space. What we're trying to do is bring in a perspective of maybe what are things that people aren't thinking about, or what are things that might come back and impact us that we haven't spent enough time thinking about, and that's where my team tries to provide a different perspective on ways that, that we might be better prepared for a future that often feels uncertain. All right, let's go. Yeah, quick question. Um, so Jeff Alderman, CMO of Ad Media. Um, hi, um, greetings from Detroit as well. Um, I just got back from Shop Talk, um, and we hosted an event for about 400 retailers, but there was also OEMs, uh, travel brands there as well. So just back to connecting the dots, would love to understand how are you connecting the dots between the changing retail mm -hmm. consumer experience and the auto buying experience? Ooh, great question, great question, right? In terms of how are, um, how are people buying, uh, shopping, exactly. How are they finding information? How are they doing things um, outside of automotive and how that might come back and impact? Absolutely, that is something that we talk about. Um, there's been a lot of shifts, especially throughout COVID in terms of how people are shopping, right? Where they're getting their information. Often what we're finding too is people are showing up to dealers so often with more information than, than the salespeople have on their vehicles. So it's, it's about understanding that this is happening whether we like it or not and how do we start to arm our dealers with like quick answers and actually that's a really great place that AI can be helpful in terms of understanding um, quick quick questions that we can type in that we can connect to um, but it's also it's recognizing where people are at can we give them more opportunities or more ways of exploring the products um, whether it be digitally um, or um, you know in the dealership, can we give them more experiences? So it's um, I don't have a specific example that our dealers are doing um, at this very moment, just to be completely honest with you. But what I would say the best way to do that is to really recognize to me it's, it's in some ways it's having to embrace where consumers are at and recognizing how these other things are changing and then what that means for the way that they're going to be walking into our showrooms. Um, or if they're going to be walking into our showrooms. How are we connecting with them outside of that? So um, often I feel like it's the, the fact that you need to be somewhat open to that change and recognizing that this is where consumers are at and what they're expecting. Um, I would say thinking back, like one of the big changes um, that happened during my career was the, the iPhone came out. <laughs> and this is at the time I was working on our touch screens in the vehicle. And it changed everything, right, in terms of what customers expected and, and how they wanted to interact with things. So uh, trying to kind of ignore it or hope it'll go away or hope that those people will just really like the experience that they had 10 years ago and we should stick to it, I think it puts your head in the sand a little bit. Um, it's, it's being open to the fact and, and recognizing that these, these, if these things are happening outside of automotive, how is it changing the, the expectation that the customer is having when they're walking in, and, and how do we help to meet those expectations for what they're showing up at the door with? Well, Jen, that was awesome. Okay. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks.